Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Danielle, AKA Stitcherista here on YouTube. And today is another face-to-face -face chat and a true crime story time. I don't remember the name of today's story. So you will hear that later. But um, update on Bill's sister. She is still the same. Uh, Bill did like video chat me while he was in the hospital room yesterday and I was able to see her. Um, it's just so awful. The whole thing is just so awful. And then I talked to him at length in the evening. And, um, yeah, I mean, she's the same, you know, not much, not much change there. So thank you to everyone's comments, good thoughts, prayers, all of that. Anything can happen as I'm about to read you an article about someone who miraculously recovered from COVID. My mom sent me this last night and I was already in bed. I didn't see it until this morning. Um, the arbitration yesterday. So, you know, we got through it. But I was extremely tired because I had been up since, you know, 3.30 that morning. And uh, my boss had sent, put a comment in the file that was like, rookie move, Danielle. And it just hit me the wrong way. I was like, what are you talking about? And I said, you know, I've been up since 3.30 a.m. Hanging on by a thread here today. And, I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, don't poke the fucking bear today. Like today is not the day. <laughs> Yesterday was not the day. Um, you know, I never truly sleep well when Bill's not here. Um, I actually slept in his bed because I, I don't feel comfortable sleeping in the basement when he's not here. And, um, yeah, I didn't go to bed till like midnight. I stitched, I finished the book. I finished the neighbor's secret. So I met my goal of 50 books. Yay. Yeah and had dinner and talked to him for a while and then came up here and did some stitching and then went in there and just watched some TV and went to sleep. Yeah, I didn't go to bed till midnight. I was up eh, about 7.15, I guess. So the article my mom sent, um, woman battling COVID-19 at Maine Medical Hospital makes miraculous recovery. So, I wanted to read you the article because I sent this to Bill and I was like, anything is possible. A Maine woman on a ventilator for 60 days. Bill's sister has been on a ventilator just a little over a month now. They, they did the math yesterday. So a Maine woman on a ventilator for 60 days after contracting COVID-19 was just a day from having life support turned off when she suddenly woke up. A day. Andrew Lerman said his mother, Bettina Lerman, 69. Now, Bill's sister is only 54, 53. She fell into a coma for more than a month and said her doctors were convinced she was not going to make it. Lerman said his mother was unvaccinated, just like Bill's sister, and had underlying health conditions, including diabetes. Lerman said the family had made funeral arrangements and were in the process of purchasing a headstone when he received a phone call from her doctor and he goes, well, I need you to come up to the hospital right away. And I'm like, what is something wrong? And he goes, well, your mother just woke up. And the guy says he literally dropped the phone. And I'm guessing you would. He was like, what? He's like, I mean, we were supposed to ter be terminating life support that day. So Lerman said he and his wife rushed to the hospital. And he said, um, we asked her, do you remember anybody talking to you and coming to see you? And she shook her head, yes. So even though she couldn't respond, even though she was in the coma, she knew people came to visit her. And Lerman said his mother is not out of the woods yet, but she is able to breathe on her own with some oxygen support. And he said, we give her words of encouragement every day. We tell her to keep on fighting. And Lerman said his plan, his mother has plans to get vaccinated. And um, can you imagine, I mean, anything is possible absolutely anything so i liked that story you like to hear stuff like that right okay oh i do have a couple other things to show you i'm like what am i doing yesterday and this couldn't have come at a better time i really really think that something's just coming to your life at the perfect time. 
So a little bit of a backstory. Five or six years ago, I met Lacey and her group of friends that have been friends for 30 plus years. And when I went to my first retreat in Ocean City at Salty Yarns, the, the stitching store, there was a woman there that was a friend of Lacey's. She lives actually lives in Easton, which is half hour outside of Ocean City. Her name is Linda. And she's an avid reader. And when I say an avid reader, like she reads, then I, I, I'm guessing she's still reading. She would go to all these conventions and things. She would read like two books a week, three books. I mean, crazy pants reading, right? And so her and I shared that. Not to mention the love of stitching, but reading. We really talked about books all, whenever I saw her. And then we would email back and forth. Like, I just read this great book. Oh, I read this horrible book. And when I was going through cancer treatment, Linda set, sent me the damn it doll where you can like beat it on something when you're frustrated. It's got like funky hair and stuff and uh, you won't like tear it open or ruin it or anything. And then we just kind of lost touch with the pandemic and everything and we, you know, haven't really been going to retreats very much. I haven't seen her in a couple years now. Well, yesterday I checked the mail and I noticed I got a letter from her and I felt something in there and I'm like, Ooh, what did she send me? She stitched me a bookmark. I literally screamed when I opened this. Um, she backed it with felt. I mean, it's yeah. And in the letter, which who sends handwritten letters really anymore? I mean, I get a lot from you guys subscribers, but just to receive a handwritten letter is just so awesome in this, age of technology and email and text messages and all that. She said she had this book and I forget what the book is called, but she said, Lacey told her, you have to stitch this for Danielle. And, uh, I haven't talked to Lacey since the retreat at the end of September. So I texted her and I said, I just received Linda's bookmark. Thank you so much for suggesting it to her. And so we talked by text for a few minutes. And I mean, the retreat's only like two weeks away. You know, it's December 3rd. So yeah, we're, we're almost there. And I can't wait. I can't wait to see Lacey again. But I sat down and I wrote Linda a letter yesterday when I had a break. So I'm putting that in the mail today. She's like, I hope you still read physical books where you can use this. Yes, once in a while. Absolutely. Are you kidding me right now? Like, that's like one of the best things I've received in a really long time. Okay. Face moisturizer. So I've been watching this woman on YouTube. Thank you to Christine from Stitch All The Things. It's Michelle something. Clean. She She's big into like buying clean products that don't have like all these additives and that don't test on animals and things like that. But she's also 54 years old and she shows how people as you get older you can do your makeup better and skincare and stuff. And I'm always looking for like, you know, because the basis of good makeup starts with good skincare. So I am always looking for like a good face wash moisturizer. Well, she suggested this moisturizer and it's in a pump, which I like. La Roche Posay. You can use it for your face and your body. This is on Amazon. I will link this down below. I used it for the first time yesterday. It is literally the best moisturizer I've ever used in my life. And I have used a lot of products. This, I woke up this morning and my face was so soft. And with winter coming, where I'm usually like really, really dry, this is just so fantastic. And like I said, I love that it's a pump. And you can use it on your body if you want. So, A plus for that. Yeah. And then the final thing I want to show you is I'm a lover of hot chocolate. But it has to be really good hot chocolate. Like not Swiss Miss, you know. The best hot chocolate I've ever had is by Land O'Lakes, you know, the company that makes the butter, which doesn't surprise me. So I bought like a variety pack and it came in this box, but it's, yeah, and you could buy the individual packs in the grocery store, but they have all different flavors, caramel, gingerbread. I cannot wait to try that one because I've never tried gingerbread. Irish cream, uh, the one I had yesterday was raspberry. They have hazelnut, butterscotch, regular chocolate. I mean, it is so rich. Like no wonder it is the butter company, right? 
And I first tried those. I worked in a law firm when I was right out of college, so like 23 years old. And they had that hot chocolate in the break room. And I would have a cup every day in the afternoon. And especially with it, you know, it getting colder and everything. Highly, I will, I will link that pack too down below. The hot chocolate pack. Oh my God, best hot chocolate I've ever had. Okay. So, oh, I don't have one of my friends. Well, they're just going to rest downstairs. I totally forgot. I was going to bring Hank up today. Oh, well. They need a rest. It's fine. Okay, so today's story is called The Meaning of Our Tears. On the early afternoon of December 25th, 1929, gunshots rever reverberated, cannot speak, across the tobacco fields outside of Germantown, North Carolina. And yet nobody paid them any mind. It was a Christmas tradition in the area for fathers and sons to pick up their shotguns after lunch and go rabbit hunting. The sound of rifle shots and shotgun blasts were part of the sonic landscape. It was only later that afternoon when neighbors arrived at the Lawson farmstead to convey their yuletide wishes that they realized the sinister meaning behind those shots. The entire family had been slaughtered. What? Okay. Charlie Lawson was somewhat of a success story in Germantown. Married to his wife, Fanny, for 18 years and the proud father of seven children. Charlie had arrived in the area some years back as an impoverished sharecropper with nothing to offer but his strong back and an appetite for hard work. That work ethic and a propensity for frugal living had allowed him to save a sizable portion on his income, enough to buy his own tract of land in 1927. Since then, he had successfully worked that patch planting and harvesting tobacco with the help of his eldest son, Arthur. Although no one would have ever mistaken the Lawsons for wealthy, Charlie was a good provider. His children never went hungry, nor lacked for any of life's necessities. In fact, Charlie had enjoyed such a good year in 1929 that he decided to treat his family. Packing them up on Christmas Eve, he drove them into Winston-Salem and bought each of them a swanky new outfit. He then ushered his brood towards a photographic studio where they posed for a family portrait. It was quite an indulgence for a working class family of that era. It would also be the last photograph taken of them alive. I mean, my grandmother used to say, you know, as kids, because she was a, I want to say she had, she was a family of eight or nine siblings. Um, you know, they would get like a new pair of shoes and an orange for Christmas, you know, shit like that. Not like, um, you know, <coughs> kids these days with the newest, you know, Nintendo or PlayStation or all the stuff, right? So the following day was Christmas with the family enjoying a rare day off from their labors. After lunch, eldest daughter Marie went into the kitchen to bake a cake. Fanny was relaxing on the porch. The baby four-month-old Mary Lou cradled in her lap. The two younger boys, James 4 and Raymond 2, were indoors. Their sisters, 12-year-old Carrie and 7-year-old Maybelle, were playing outside. Arthur, a strapping lad of 16, had been dispatched to buy some shotgun shells for the rabbit hunt. It was a chore that would save his life because he wasn't there. Shortly after his son departed, Charlie went into the house and fetched his shotgun. I hope it explains why he did this. So it is impossible to imagine what must have been going through Charlie Lawson's mind at this time. All we know is that he went looking for Carrie and Maybelle and found them as they headed for the barn. The girls had just rounded the corner of the building when they encountered their father. Charles Lawson had his 12 gauge tucked into his shoulder, the barrel leveled at his daughters. Without saying a word, he pulled off two shots cutting the little girls down where they stood. I'm telling you, it better explain it. It just doesn't make sense, right? He then reloaded and walked purposefully towards the house where Fanny was now standing and peering out into the yard, a concerned expression on her face. I bet she was. Fanny started to say something, but she never got the chance. A blast from the shotgun killed her right where she stood. She collapsed to the hard boards of the porch, still holding the baby. Oh, my God. 
The terrified infant was screaming and Charlie silenced its cries by reversing the shotgun and bringing the butt down hard on the child's head, shattering her skull. What? Then he entered the house. Remember, the daughter's in there making a cake, right? Marie was in the kitchen, backed up against the stove, where just moments ago she had removed her cake from the oven, and Pa was all she got out before Charlie shot her dead. Then he reloaded before he went looking for his two young sons. James and Raymond had heard the ruckus and were trying to hide when Charlie found them. Oh, my God. Their screams were drowned out by the boom of the shotgun. I just, I can't wrap my brain around this right now. His entire family, bar Arthur, because remember, Arthur is going to get shells at the store, was now dead, but Charlie Lawson wasn't done yet. He now dragged the bodies outside, arranged them in a neat row, and then collected a pile of even-sized rocks and placed one of these under each of their heads. Then he folded each of his victims' arms across their chest, placing them in a grotesquely funeral pose. Satisfied with this display, he gave a grunt of satisfaction before turning on his heel and walking back towards the house. Skirting the building, he stepped into the woods that bounded his property. Soon the trees had swallowed him up. What is going to be the end of this story? So, Charlie Lawson would remain there, hidden from sight as the bodies were discovered and all hell broke loose, which, yeah... Soon the word was out and morbid sightseers were flocking to the farm for a glimpse of the carnage. By the time the local sheriff arrived, he had to fight his way through the crowd. Gaining control of the situation, the authorities cordoned off the building and then prepared to launch a search for the missing Charlie. At this stage, it wasn't clear whether he was a victim or the perpetrator. Yeah, I mean, obviously they wouldn't know. Then Arthur got back from his chore and discovered that his family had been massacred in his absence. Can you even imagine that? Finally, in the midst of this chaos, a single shot sounded from the woods. The sheriff and his men immediately entered the trees. Following the sound, half of the crowd crashing through the undergrowth after them. Can you imagine? They found Charlie Lawson slumped against the tree, dead of a bullet wound to the head. Tracks around the tree trunk suggested that he had been pacing for some time before taking his own life. In his pocket, the sheriff found two handwritten notes. Troubles can cause, one of them said. Nobody to blame but, read the other. Charlie had not completed either sentence. Okay. And the incomplete sentences were just two of the many unanswered questions that would spring up around this case. And the key question was why, which is what I said. I'm always like, why? Why would you shoot your entire family and then yourself? Why would a seemingly normal man suddenly take up a shotgun and massacre his entire family? So the prevailing belief was that Charlie had not been normal at all. A few months earlier, he had sustained a serious head injury and a fall. The theory was that he had driven he had suffered brain damage and had been driven into a homicidal rage however the autopsy would disprove this viewpoint the pathologist found no evidence of brain injury another rumor doing the rounds at the time was that charlie and his family had witnessed something during their trip to winston salem and had been marked for death by some criminal element okay so they're saying he didn't do it but this does not gel with the evidence there can be little doubt that Lawson was the shooter and that the murders were premeditated. In this context, the pre-Christmas shopping trip makes sense, as does the family photo shoot. It seems that Charlie wanted a photographic record of his brood before he gunned them down. Arthur's impromptu trip to the general store also fits this scenario. The aforementioned family photograph shows him to be a powerfully built boy who was already taller than his father, so Charlie clearly wanted him out of the way so that he would not interfere with his plans. Yeah, he might have been able to overpower him, right? But that still does not explain why Charlie did it. A latter-day idea is that Lawson had been involved in an incestuous relationship with his oldest daughter, Marie, and that Marie had become pregnant with his child. Well, when they did an autopsy, wouldn't they have been able to discover that? Several of the Lawson's relatives believed this to be true, and so did Marie's best friend, who later claimed that Marie had confided in her that she was expecting her father's child. What? 
If this is indeed the case, then Fanny must have known about it. There would have been no way to keep that dirty little secret in the cramped farmhouse. So, is that why Charlie Lawson turned his shotgun on his family? Were there tensions between him and his wife? Did he fear being arrested once Marie's pregnancy came to light? Did he fear being shamed and ostracized? We will never know for certain. What we do know is that the case became a sensation, attracting morbid visitors to the death house from far and wide. Charlie's entrepreneurial brother, Marion, saw an opportunity in this and quickly fenced off the house. He then placed an ad in the local newspaper offering guided tours at 25 cents a pop. At its peak, the house was attracting 500 visitors a day. So in 1929, what was 25 cents, like in today's era? Marion would later take his exhibition on the road with a tent show at Mount Airy's County Fair. Jeez fucking Christ, like what? The Lawson case would also be eulogized in song, including a ballad called The Murder of the Lawson Family by Walter Kidd Smith, which was a local hit for Columbia Records. Rumor has it that in his later years, Arthur Lawson would sometimes lock himself in his room with a bottle of whiskey and listen to that record over and over again. In 1945, after one of these binges, Arthur got into his car and killed himself in a car wreck. He left behind a wife and four kids. He was just 32 years old. So all eight of the Lawson clan who perished that day, including Charlie, are buried in a row in a Stokes County cemetery. They are commemorated by a single headstone which reads, Not now, but in the coming years, it will be in a better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears, and then sometime we'll understand. Local legend has it that when the leaves drop in the fall, they pile up on all of the graves except Charlie's. What an awful, awful story. I can't imagine. That's just awful. I mean, I'm guessing, though, he probably did it because of his daughter getting pregnant by him. Because that would have brought extreme shame and that would not have been good, you know, because there probably was no abortion then. So she would have had the baby and God, hmm. the, if you remember, the little baby was only like, what, two months old, four months old? I can't. I just. Wow. Okay. So I hope you guys are all having a great Thursday. Only two more days left in this week for the arbitration. And then I have off next week. Let's go. Yeah. Need off. Need a break. So as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments section below and I will answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much for watching and subscribing and I will see you in my next video.